Can you? Okay, seventy-eight. Okay, we'll keep going. Yeah. Okay, thank you everybody for being here. If you, uh, for those in the back, if you don't mind grabbing a seat. Uh, it's really nice to see many of you in person. I was just joking with Pedro, Dr. Petty. We should give awards out every in-person Grand Rounds. Nice to see physically people joining. I know there's also, as usual, a lot of people joining online and still joining. So thank you for those of you who are also online. But again, thank you for everybody who's coming here in person. Great to see you. I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Fetty. As you probably many of you or all you know, he is our relatively new uh, vice uh, chief, uh, vice chair of education. Uh, just about a year ago, he was coming up here to receive an education award himself. So Dr. Vizzi, thank you so much. I'll turn it over to you. Thanks so much, Errol. Thank you all for making time uh, in your morning to come here and support uh, education. I know a lot of people in the room, but um, many that I don't. Uh, my name is Pedro Fatehi. I'm a nephrologist and an intensivist. Uh, I was raised by Persian immigrants. They're both math teachers. And I remember as a kid sitting in the back of their classrooms, watching them teach and thinking, what a wonderful and positive impact they had on students. So when it was my time to declare what I would do in high school, I said, I will indeed become a math teacher like them. Uh, as you might imagine, uh, their faces had some grief upon, the, upon them. And they looked back and said, maybe you should have a backup plan, like medicine or something. Um, that, that obviously worked out, but the positive impact that they had on me then um, stayed. And so it's particularly special to celebrate the people who have valued and supported education for trainees uh, here at Stanford. Uh, this is the group that has leaned in to help make sure that the people that will take care of all of us are well trained and are excellent doctors, the people that lead discovery, the people that lead uh, the, the education of future uh, generations of healthcare providers. Um, as my parents subtly or not so subtly suggested then, uh, the work of education and teaching is often unrecognized and un, uh, underappreciated, uh, but today is the day well, where we shall appreciate them. So thank you all again for, uh, for coming to recognize these wonderful educators. Uh, as I call names from each division, I'm going to ask you guys to please come up uh, and stand along here. Errol will uh, present a certificate. I will ask the audience to just hold their applause until the end. Uh, and then we will uh, go from there. In addition, I just want to thank uh, administrative staff who help all of this uh, happen. Rissell is a wonderful example here, and there are many others in the crowd, as well as the division leaders who've made time to join us and support the, uh, their educators within their divisions. And then, of course, our, our own leadership, our, our department chair, uh, Dr. Maldonado, Dean uh, Miners joining us as well, as well as uh, Dean Gazutite. So thank you all again for making time. So I'll call names. Please come up and hold your applause. Um, we will start with bioinformatics and research, Summer Hahn, uh, bone marrow and transplant is Matthew Frank. I don't think Dr. Frank is able to join. Okay, very good. We have somebody accepting in his presence. <laughs> From cardiovascular medicine, uh, Ron Wattellis. From endocrinology, gerontology, and metabolism, Andrea Tom. From hematology, Carolyn Berube. From uh, hospital medicine, Eric Strong. From immunology and rheumatology, Audra Hormansky. From infectious disease, Marissa Holobar. From nephrology, uh, Abraham Aaron, who can't join us today. From oncology, Tyler Johnson. From primary care and population health, uh, we have a few people. Uh, David Chang. Felicia, Felicia Huey. And Shan Angela Jiang. From Pulmonary Allergy and Critical Care Medicine, William Aoyoung. It's also William's birthday today, I was recently told. So happy birthday, William. <laughs> From Stanford Tri-Valley, Alice Cha. 
from from Stanford Prevention and Research Center, uh, Shauna Fallis. Uh, the last award will be for our, uh, let's actually, let's give this group a round of applause. I'm just going to announce uh, the Master Teacher Award, which is Dr. Paul Quo. I'll ask him to come up. And as he does, I will give his uh, bio. Uh, Dr. Quo is a professor of medicine and director of hepatology here at Stanford. He's been here since 2016. He joined uh, from Indiana University, where he was for 21 years as medical director of liver transplantation. His uh, medical degree was from Wayne State University, internal medicine training at University of Maryland, and GI Hepatology Fellowship at Mayo Clinic in Rochester. He is Associate Editor uh, for Clinical and Molecular Hepatology, serves on the editorial boards of multiple journals, including Hepatology, Hepatology Communications, and the Journal of Clinical Gastroenterology. He has distinguished himself in the field of viral hepatitis and served as principal investigator for multiple seminal trials uh, that have been published in journals, including the New England Journal, uh, Lancet, Gastroenterology, Hepatology, Journal of Hepatology, and multiple others. And he served on multiple uh, committees uh, for AASLD, ACG, uh, and ABIM, in addition to other or organizations. Multiple awards for his clinical care as well as teaching. And he clearly uh, values mentoring college students, medical students, residents, fellows, and junior faculty. On a personal note, I've had the benefit of taking care of very sick patients in the ICU with liver failure uh, with Dr. Quo. And I've had the benefit of lecturing to preclinical medical students with him. So it's no surprise to me that uh, he's recognized today as a master uh, teacher. Congratulations, Dr. Quo. So yeah. Yeah, well done. Thank you. George, thank you for making the trip out from, uh, from New England. And congratulations to you, you. on receiving uh, this recognition from us today, but of course, also on the enormous impact you've had in medical education. Maybe we can start in, can you tell us about your career? What got you interested in medicine first? And then what got you interested very early in your career on medical education? Thanks, Lloyd. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to do this interview. I just want to acknowledge my friend Kelly at the beginning. I'm here because of Kelly. Like I would think many people in this room are here because of Kelly. So I join the crowd in being here because of Kelly and the chance uh, to be, uh, be, be in the, the reflected uh, uh, glory of being next to Kelly is, is the reason that I came. So my interest in medicine actually started as a child. I grew up in a little town in upstate New York called Chittenango about 2,500 people at that time. My father was a general practitioner in town. Office was in our house. Uh, he cared for all patients who came, uh, charged them on a sliding scale and some paid by produce, giving produce on our back porch and repairing uh, or painting the house. And that was the medicine I grew up with. I made house calls with them and the people in the town called me little doc. And, actually thought I was gonna come back to practice medicine there. I went to college and I didn't know what I wanted to do, or at least I pretended I didn't know what I wanted to do. And I majored in philosophy. I don't know whether that was a protest move, but it was one of the smartest things I ever did. Actually, I think it's one of the best training to become a doctor that I can think of. Sadly, my father died of a heart attack at the age of 49 after my first year of college. And I managed in spite and continued to major in philosophy, but took enough science electives. I was able to apply to medical school, fulfilling almost all of the requirements. Uh, uh, one caveat was uh, I didn't, I had only one semester of calculus. And when I got admitted to Harvard Medical School, they insisted I take a second course of calculus in my second, in my second semester, my fourth year of college. I must say that is, been an invaluable contribution to my career. Um, so I, I uh, went to Harvard Medical School, trained in internal medicine at the MGH, and uh, I got turned on to medicine, the third year of medicine, the clerkship years of medicine. I knew that was, I was where I wanted to be. Inspired by great teachers, uh, Roman De Sanctis, Sam Thier, 
uh, Dan Fetterman, my really long standing mentor. I knew that I wanted to be a clinician. I knew I wanted to teach like they taught, but I wasn't clear how you could do that. I finished training there. I went on a train in cardiology. I came back, I was chief resident at the MGH. And that year was transformative for me. There was only one chief resident. And uh, for a year I was immersed in teaching these bright house staff and discovered that uh, you don't really know a subject until you teach it. And that was a real lesson. There's all these things that I thought I knew, I didn't know as well until I had to teach it to these young, uh, very ambitious, very bright people because I had to convince them that what I was saying was true. At the end of that, I said, this is what I want to do the rest of my life. And people said, sure, you can't be a chief resident for the rest of your life. And I said, well, I'm going to figure out how to do that. And they said, well, you can do it, of course, but you'll never be promoted to Harvard if that's what you want to do. I said, OK, I'm still going to do it. So I was very fortunate uh, to be asked to be the program director just two years out of chief residency. And that year kind of really solidified that 10 year period of working so closely with house staff not only teaching them medicine, but learning about life together. That to me inspired me to say, I wanted to continue to do that. I went on to be the chief uh, at the VA hospital affiliate with Harvard where I had this same opportunity with, with house staff, but I also had it with junior faculty and the development of junior faculty gave me the same sense of joy. And so that really, those two positions early in my career laid the foundation uh, for what I wanted to do. And I really believe that every position in academic medicine is a teaching position if you want it to be. Every job is teaching that's a part of it, whether it's teaching faculty, teaching uh, residents and students, teaching other staff, teaching other professions, being involved in interprofessional activity. So I was very fortunate that I was given lots of opportunities, but always had teaching at the center and the core of it. And it inspired me to do a couple of things along the way that I think were very important to me because they reflected how we need to continue to change the culture to recognize teaching and careers of teachers. When I was at Harvard, I founded the first academy at Harvard uh, for teaching. And uh, someone could say, why do you need an academy for teaching at Harvard? Isn't that what Harvard is? But we all know that the teaching part was often put aside for the intensity of the clinical activity and the need to have grants for research. So we wanted to recognize the contribution that teaching made by creating the academy. And then at the Macy Foundation, and Kelly was central to this, we created a program called the Macy Faculty Scholar Program, which was in recognition of my belief after a career of watching this, that faculty who want to pursue a career in education and in educational innovation do not have an obvious pathway to do it. And they needed, uh, they needed mentoring but they also needed most valuably protected time and a key part in their career to pursue an idea. And the idea of the Macy Faculty Scholar Program was to allow that nurturing to occur at a key point in their career. So started from small town GP in, in Chittenango to uh, having opportunities I never would have imagined having. That's wonderful. How? How has medical education changed over the course of your career? What's remained the same? What's changed? What's well, gotten better? And yeah, what yeah. maybe have we lost that we shouldn't yeah. have lost along the way? Well, that, that's a great question. I mean, obviously, the technology has changed things dramatically, and it's going to change it even more in ways that we can't even imagine now. Uh, you know, the use of simulation, uh, the use of asynchronous learning, the use of computerized databases, all those properly harnessed have and can make education better, but they will never replace the personal touch. So the, I think the challenge we have going forward is to figure out how to blend them in, how to use these technologies in a way that uh, increase our reach, increase our uh, 
uh, ability to transmit information, which is what we, faculty used to spend a lot of time transmitting information. And now we realize that actually isn't the most valuable use of faculty because information can be transmitted in a lot of ways, but faculty can teach us analytical skills, empathetic skills, uh, team-based skills. So we, we need to change the focus of what the faculty does, use the technology to do some things that we used to rely on faculty to do, but emphasize all the time that medicine, while it is scientifically based and must be grounded in the most intense knowledge of science, is still at its core a humanistic activity. And only human beings can relate that humanistic activity. So I believe the role of faculty increasingly is to preserve the humanism in medicine, to preserve the interest, the value and the dignity of the individual in medicine. And so we need to spend more time thinking about the different roles. Technology frees us up to, uh, uh, to use our skills in different ways than just to transmit knowledge. Now, at the same time, there are a whole lot of other trends going on that I think are very important that we recognize to augment education. A very important one is interprofessional education that I emphasized a lot when I was at the Macy Foundation. You know, we, we're gonna work in teams the rest of our lives in all aspects of providing clinical care. But if you think, look at the way we've designed our educational system, you wouldn't think that that's what we were preparing people for <laughs> because we, we keep all of our learners in the various health professions totally separate from each other by intent. And we reinforce stereotypes that are negative about uh, 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 the appreciation of the roles that everybody plays. So we've worked a lot to break those silos down. And I believe the future of education is an interprofessional work of learning how you have team-based skills of learning what the, the things that can be offered by the other professions. We also teach clinical medicine in a fragmented fashion. From the time of the Flexner report, we have had a hospital-based approach based on months long rotations here, or there, sometimes a little longer than a month, sometimes shorter than a month. And if you think about how medicine is, how healthcare is delivered over time, people with chronic illness, people who are not just hospital uh, uh, residents, but live in a society, uh, we, we need to reorient our clinical training towards a longitudinal approach so that we think about patients over time, we think about relationships with other health professionals over time, and we think about relationships between learners and faculty members over time. So I think those are some of the trends we, that and recognizing the very important contribution of the social determinants of health and, and how we incorporate that into our educational process and into the way we teach clinical medicine. We're, I think all of us that uh, have been watching some of us from the sidelines, some being directly involved, particularly here at Stanford, in the evolution of artificial intelligence and its application to health, healthcare, biomedicine, have been impressed by what we've seen and what we're seeing. I think, uh, just speaking personally, using chat, GPT, BARD, other large language models that are now available, it's been, it's been phenomenal what, uh, how, if, knowledge or information can be assimilated into uh, a usable form of knowledge. How, how does that impact the way we think about educating the next generation of physicians, physician scientists, um, people in medicine? I think we have, during our careers, witnessed the evolution from what was 90 plus percent a, a memorization, rote knowledge-based assessment of the skills of a physician in training, moving away from that, but still having a large component of it being based upon that. And now, of course, 
with, with some notable issues that are still being resolved because after all these large language models were only introduced in November of 2022, they do occasionally hallucinate, but they, uh, but, but they also provide an incredible source of information readily available at our fingertips as, as physicians. How does that influence how we think about, because as medical educators, we really are looking at preparing our students, our trainees, for the next 30 to 40 years of their careers, recognizing that in ways we don't, can't even fathom today, it's going to be different a decade, two, three decades from now. So how do we think about adjusting medical education to what's available today and increasingly what's going to be available in the future through generative AI? Yeah. Well, that's a great question, and I'll start by saying I don't know the answer to the question, <laughs> but it's interesting to watch the, the evolution of this. You know, when AI, you know, AI in its various forms is not new, of course. People have been talking about using computerized models as sources of information going back to the 50s and 60s. In fact, there have been many articles written about how doctors are not going to be necessary and they're going to be eliminated uh, by artificial intelligence. And there's all of this kind of little bit of fear talk out there, that the threat of AI taking away our prerogatives and our standing. Um, you know, I, I think we've, we've moved to, a, I hope, a somewhat more intelligent way of looking at this now, that AI is not a threat, but it could, it could be and should be an ally. And I think our greatest challenge is to figure out how to make that alliance right. It, it's not eliminating the doctor. It's not eliminating the, some of the things I just talked about, the, the power of reason, the power of, of, of uh, empathy, the importance of hu humanism in medicine, but how we can make artificial intelligence an ally. Uh, and that starts with the learning process. Well, you have to learn about it. Now we're learning a lot already. You know, we, we've learned a lot about some of the algorithmic approaches to medicine uh, can, in, can reinforce and worsen biases, depending on the database you use and what your source of patients are, depending upon the algorithm you use and what corrective measures you put in, you can end up with bias uh, outcomes. That, uh, that actually have an increased health disparities by treating patient populations differently that, that is not based on reasonable science. So one of the things we need to do in education is to teach our learners what the good parts and the bad parts are. What are the things you should worry about if you're gonna use algorithms? How do you know what do you know about the ingredients of the algorithms? How were they put together? What database was used? And then we come to using the more generative forms of artificial intelligence. We need to have a better feeling for what the inputs for that are. What are the, what are the limitations of its use? Um, a lot of artificial intelligence can help make the administrative part of, of practicing medicine easier if we can generate notes that way, if we can organize information better that way, if we can transmit information better that way, store information better that way. But one of the things we need to work with our learners so they understand how to do that and they know what the limitations are. We don't wanna to get to a point where people graduate from medical school thinking that if Google says it's true, it's true. Um, we want to go to the sources. We want to have the same inquisitive mind, the same kind of challenge of what's your basis of knowing that? And what are the sources of information? So I think kind of relearning that, um, uh, that scientific model, if you will, with AI incorporated into it. But I, we don't want to create a generation of physicians who become passive learners, who have learned how to look something up and they get a quick answer to it and have stopped asking the question about, does that really apply to this patient in this setting? So we, we need to be sure that our use of artificial intelligence, as good as it is, as powerful as it is, does not stop inquisitiveness and does not stop our search for the 
best care for this particular patient in front of me at this time. And that care, which involves not only the right diagnosis and the right treatment, but it's the right approach to the person as a person. So that's our challenge. And in some ways, I can look at where things are now from my perspective and say, well, I'm glad that's somebody else's problem to deal with. In another way, I'm a little bit envious because I would like to be involved in helping to solve that problem too. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> no, we've witnessed and continue to witness it with generations, there are changes in attitudes and culture and expectations, both career-wise in terms of what individuals and people of generations expect in terms of their professional lives, their personal lives. Can you talk about in your career how you've seen that change among the students you've worked with, you've mentored, um, and both attitudes about the profession of medicine, but also attitudes about balancing the practice of medicine, the profession of medicine with things outside of the direct purview of the profession? Uh, great question. So yes, um, societies change. Lo and behold, thank heavens they change. It'd be <laughs> awful if they didn't change. And, uh, and, and certainly uh, the, the, uh, the view, uh, which I heartily endorse, but I think we both would agree was not necessarily the view when we grew up in medicine that this uh, more holistic view of your life is not just being a doctor, it's being a person, uh, being a, a spouse or partner, being a parent, uh, being a member of society in a broader sense of participating in, uh, uh, in activities that are uh, uh, improving society as a whole beyond the contribution you make uh, from your profession. And I think that more balanced view of, of individual life, uh, which I think is more possessed by the uh, younger generation is, is a good view and one that we should be endorsing. You know, we've moved from the work schedule as a house officer that I had and that I oversaw as a program director uh, to what some would say is still not very reasonable 80 hour work week. And some people say, why is that reasonable? <laughs> but compared with what it was, it is reasonable. So finding the right, this idea of balance, I think makes us better physicians and makes us better people. And the idea that physicians should be, have broader roles, uh, both not only in their family, but in society, I think is important. I talk about humanism in medicine. Well, there's humanism in society too. And I think we should be addressing uh, and, and feel responsible for addressing the anti-humanistic uh, forces uh, that exist in society. And uh, some part of our thought and energy should be on that. At the same time, what we don't want to lose, and I think that the, 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 the tension right now uh, in, in, in redefining this broader uh, role of uh, the physician as an individual uh, in a, and not only in a profession, but in a family and in a society is to not lose the idealism, to not use, lose the commitment uh, uh, to the very special calling that it is to be a physician, the special responsibility that we have uh, taking care of people in their most vulnerable place in their life. And the very important ideals and professionalism that comes with it that is an important marker uh, of what makes this profession so great. So I th think there is a bit of a struggle right now between redefining these roles in the appropriate way, thinking more broadly about them, but how do we preserve the idealism, the professionalism, uh, that has made it so special and continues to make it special to be a physician. I'm very encouraged. Uh, you know, I don't spend as much time as I used to. I was saying uh, to a group I was with last night, you know, when I was at the VA, I rounded someplace every day. 
Yeah. I had what I, I called at the time, I said, I had the best chief of medicine job in the world. I have what chief of medicine used to be able to do, but as departments have gotten bigger and bigger and bigger, that running a department is more like running a large corporation in a business. And I got to run a small department, very personal. I rounded every day in some place, in the ICU, in the clinic, in general medicine wards, and cardiology. And I was in constant contact uh, with the young people. I don't have that constant contact anymore, but I travel, I visit. I'm very optimistic that the idealism that I hope for and talk about is very much there. It's very much in the young people. They want to do the right thing. They care deeply, not only about the profession, but they care deeply about society. And I think that's important. Uh, those two go together. Uh, uh, the being a good physician means you care about society. Uh, and uh, so I, I don't think the, this conversation is ever going to be over because other pressures come in, uh, economic pressures, political pressures that uh, do, have a, do have an influence what goes on. I'm worried, I'm worried about restrictions on uh, medical practice, restrictions on education broadly. Uh, that are part of our current political process that I think are something we should be concerned about, regardless of our political views, should be concerned about in terms of protecting the profession, the values we hold dear, and protecting our role in wanting what's best for all of our patients. So I think the physician role in society is very important, more important than ever. Um, but I'm encouraged of the idealism that I see and feel as I travel around and talk to young people. I'm, I'm not one that disparages. I hear at times, oh, you know, well, they don't want to work as hard as we used to work, and they don't have the same drive that we have. I, I don't believe that. I don't believe that. Uh, so I think the drive is there. I think that the uh, idealism is there. I think that we need to create the environments uh, that bring out the best in all of our uh, people. Uh, and I think that's part of the responsibility of all of us uh, who are involved in helping to run organizations is to see that we have a, 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 a learning and a, 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 a clinical environment uh, that brings out the best in everybody. That's wonderful. Maybe one final quick question, then Errol is going to moderate some Q&A, both from the audience here and also the audience joining on the live stream. Uh, what are the characteristics that are most important, in your view, in defining effective leadership today and moving forward? Well, uh, it's easy to define the things that aren't <laughs> sometimes and what it's is. It's true. <laughs> uh, but uh, I think, um, I think, you know, people become leaders in a variety of ways. You know, I was thinking at the beginning, you asked me a career, you know, a career only happens in retrospect. As you're doing it, it's not a career. As you're doing it, you're just doing it. And then when it's over, you look back at it and said, oh, this was my career. And I guess the same is a little bit true of leadership. You know, uh, you don't really know um, as, as you take things on, as you kind of gradually move up and, and, uh, you say, oh yeah, I was. I guess that was leadership there. I didn't really wasn't really thinking of that as leadership, and uh, so leadership is also somewhat in retrospect rather than a prospect. But I think that I think the good leader, first of all, has to know what they're doing. And uh, I mean, I know that seems obvious, but you know, a lot of times people are put in leadership positions because they did something else, and then it's transferred over to this and they actually weren't prepared for that. So I think one good thing about a leader, aspiring to be a leader, is to be sure you know what it is you're gonna lead. If you're gonna lead in clinical medicine, you ought to be good at clinical medicine and spend a lot of time getting good at that in order to lead it. You have to be credible in what you do. So whatever it is, you ought to be good at it. You have to be credible at it. You have to spend a lot of time doing that so it doesn't come easily. Uh, so I don't, I've never, you know, People say, well, I took a leadership course and now I want to be a leader. <laughs> and I, no, it doesn't work that way. Um, 
And good leaders uh, uh, have to uh, listen and they have to be uh, open to new ideas. Uh, there is no formula that tells you when you start out on something, this is the way it must be done. And if there is, you shouldn't listen to that formula because whatever the formula was based on is probably no longer true today. So leaders have to be adaptable. They have to listen. They have to take in information from a variety of sources, not just the ones that they're most comfortable with. And by a variety of sources, I mean outside of their own profession too. I'm a real believer, as I've said before, in interprofessional work. I think that wherever you are, there are things that are known by people um, who are outside your own um, sphere uh, that will inform you if you listen to them and you ask for their help and their input. And most people uh, wanna give input if they're asked. So a leader has to be broad in, in where they seek information. Uh, they have to be open, they have to be flexible, but ultimately they have to be decisive. So, you know, you can't spend all the time uh, just taking an opinion. And sometimes decisiveness means responding to a fairly emergent thing. You have to use your instincts and past experience, or it, it's after a finite period of review, come to a decision and move forward. Um, but um, uh, leadership is earned and it's constantly earned. It, 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 it's, it's, you can have a great success, have a good moment in time. You've reached some goal that you've set for your organization or your program, um, but then the clock starts all over again. Uh, you know, you don't actually get a lot of credit for that going forward. You've got to solve the next problem. So you have to constantly re-earn re uh, the uh, credibility of, of being a leader. George, thank you so much. And it's a real honor to be able to talk with you here today. Um, I'm going to have to run to another interview, but uh, Errol is going to moderate the yes, Q&A. And thank you, everyone, for joining today. And we look forward to your questions and also questions from those joining on the live stream. Yeah. George, thank, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Minus, for being with us today. I appreciate it. Um, great. I see questions popping up. Thank you for those of you. There's a lot of people on Zoom watching as well. There's already yeah. questions coming in, but I will start. Dr. Miklos, I'll turn it over to you. Hi, I'm Dave Miklos, and I'm a bone marrow transplant chief. Um, thank you for being with us today. That was really fantastic, and I trained at the Brigham and uh, benefited from all that you made possible. Uh, two quick questions. Do you have a Twitter handle? And then secondly, um, I don't, by the way. And then secondly, how do you look at the um, need to, or feelings, or the, the process of unionization in this um, fellowship and in our mm. apprenticeship as you described it? Yeah, uh, I don't have a Twitter. So uh, and you can draw any conclusion you want from that <laughs> about where I am. <laughs> um, Unionization, that's a, it's a great problem, and it's one that vexes me a lot. Uh, um, you know, I, I, you know, as a uh, kind of philosophically, and where I am in my own kind of political views, I believe strongly in unions and the importance that they've had in our society, our history, uh, for uh, 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 improving the rights of workers improving the, the status of workers. And I believe historically that unions are a very important force. Having said that, <laughs> I have great concerns about the, the combination of unions in a profession and, and, uh, and creating a more potential adversarial situation that should be a collaborative mentoring situation. So I worry a lot about that. I think about the relationship I had with my trainees over the years, and I don't know how I would have done that, how I would have negotiated that in the union setting. And maybe I would have learned it and it would have been okay. I'm not, I'm not saying I don't have enough experience. I have no experience with it to make a foregone conclusion that it must be bad, but it certainly feels like it would be different. 
uh, it would change the dynamic of, uh, of whether we're all in this together. And my goal in life is to see you improve and that that's why I'm here. Uh, I, I, I think I understand, or I have some understanding of the trends that have taken it this way, uh, that the kind of increasing pressure in the whole healthcare system. Uh, I, I do worry that there are things that happened at a variety of organizations for different reasons at different times that have created more of a sense of adversarial relationship between administrations and, uh, uh, and house staff and fellows. And I lament that. And again, I, not having been there, I can't say, well, I would have done it differently. If I had been there, that mistake wouldn't have happened. I can't be presumptuous enough to know that I could have avoided that. But I do worry that it is a result of a deterioration of the environment in which we're working. Uh, that uh, people don't feel as supported as they should feel. And they don't feel that people are necessarily looking out for them. And that leads to them looking for other sources of support. So I, I uh, uh, you know, uh, my institution that I spent most of my career at, as General Brigham, as how staff has voted to unionize. And I must say that was a that was a sad day for me. I wasn't there. I had no part of it whatsoever. I read it in the newspaper is how I learned about it. And I felt sad. I felt sad. I felt well, something's failed here that has gotten us to that. Now we've got to figure out how to do it. We're not going to reverse this. I think you know, Stanford's done it, MGB has done it, other people are looking at it and say, well, if they can do it, we can do it. And we got to figure out how to do it in such a way that we don't lose the sense of mentorship and support. Um, and, and I'm, I, I don't want to say this is uniformly awful. This is terrible, but I do want to say, we got to figure it out. We got to figure out how, how to get through this and then figure out what it was, you know, what is the message it gave about how we, we as organizations and as leadership and organizations might have done things differently. So that's where I am. I'm watching it. I'm puzzled by it and a little uneasy by it. We'll go to Dr. Singh next and then I'll jump over to Zoom. Yeah, hi, good morning. That was wonderful. Thank you so much. I'm Upi Singh. I'm the division chief for infectious diseases. I wanted to, um, to ask your thoughts on the linking between teaching, which you've talked a lot about, and our roles in society and our, our being a citizen of the world. Can you talk to us about your thoughts um, about how all of us as physicians, as, as healthcare workers, as being med, uh, members of the medical profession should help educate society? I think what we saw in the last several years is sort of this loss of trust. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and, and I think a lot of it may have come from sort of the fact that we didn't train ourselves to daily, weekly mm -hmm. communicate uh, with the world. So I'd love to hear your yeah, thoughts. Yeah, Thank you. No, great question. Well, you know, first of all, you start locally, you start with the people that you know and you work with and um, talk to them, get their ideas and, and, and be comfortable giving your own ideas and your reason for them. Um, and then I think everybody's going to have their way. First of all, I say we all should be voting, you know, you know, whenever you vote, vote, uh, participating in the democratic process. If we really believe in the democratic process, we have to participate in it. And at least that means voting and whether it means becoming part of any organization to support a particular idea or a particular candidate. I think physicians should at least think about that uh, and which, which issue is most important to you uh, and to choose to be a part of it, choose to be part of a process. Uh, and to participate at the level that you're comfortable participating. And some people will participate more than others. <clears throat> but I think you're right. I think we've, we, we somewhat gave up along the lines, um, some idea that we uh, uh, have, um, have something to offer, some, uh, some voice and some way to talk about 
the things that we care about and to talk about it in a factual basis, a scientific basis, uh, away from the, um, uh, you know, negativism uh, and uh, uh, vitriol uh, that has characterized some of the political discourse. Uh, it, it's um, not, uh, not going to be easy to, to, to change that, but we've gone through other times in our history in which we've had uh, d divided society and, and uh, 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 a lot of uh, anger. And I, I think we can get through it, but I think we as citizens should be participating in that. We're, we're educated, we're well-trained. And it doesn't mean by any means that all physicians should take the same point of view. Uh, and because we are a diverse group like any others, but I think we can speak to some issues, particularly around the importance of science and the importance of data uh, driven information and particularly about issues that directly relate patient care that we should be speaking up. Uh, going online here, I have a, a question from Dr. <laughs> Golden, the most upvoted one. Do you feel that financial reimbursement matches our efforts in medicine these days? not just at Stanford and also particularly in internal medicine? Well, of course, the, 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 I mean, that's kind of a, a softball answer. The answer, of course, is no. <laughs> and the question is, did it ever? And, and the question is, uh, I, I uh, uh, you know, I, I, there's a lot to be said and I'm, I'm, I'm not here as an expert on healthcare financing or the, organization of our healthcare system, I have my own ideas about a potentially more rational way to do it, but we have, we have the system we have. Uh, and I don't think that the resources are distributed in a way that is necessarily optimal for optimal societal outcomes. And I think that's manifested by the fact that, uh, you know, compared to our wealth, we have uh, uh, less good outcomes than uh, most of the other developed part of the world. So I, I think there's a lot to be done to rethink that. Now, in an individual level, <coughs> issues of reimbursement, um, you know, by division or by specialty uh, vary a lot from organization to organization, how those are handled and, uh, and who has a say in it. And, and uh, again, I think that systems that are more participatory, that are open, and transparent about um, uh, formulas for distribution of resources are the most successful ones. So I, again, I don't know enough about the inner workings of Stanford and I don't wanna to speak to it, but you know, the more transparency there is, the better, I think. Uh, and, and, and we also have to realize, and I particularly say when I speak about teachings and the reward of teaching, that we do things for other reasons than just financial reimbursement. And it's important to be reimbursed and feel comfortable with your reimbursements. It's important to have a standard of living that is appropriate for the work that you've put in, but not everything you do is going to be reimbursed for. And that's true not only of your patient care, but it's true of your mentoring and it's true of your teaching. And there are rewards other than financial rewards and we have to appreciate the importance of those as well. Here, uh, Dr. Rosbach uh, asks, uh, recognizing the limited pipeline of US physicians we are developing, particularly to meet the needs of the underserved populations, how can we inspire people to enter medicine and develop our physician workforce? Oh, that's a great question. I think, again, comes back. I think we all play a role in that. Uh, we need to... Uh, we need to reach out to uh, uh, and start early and uh, uh, pipeline programs that reach down into elementary school to get people to think about careers, not just in medicine, it's like careers more bro broadly in the health professions. <coughs> it's very important um, because right now the health profession doesn't look like the population we serve in, in and, it's, and it's actually getting worse, not better. The, population is diversifying faster than we are diversifying. And part of the problem is that many people uh, don't even think about the possibility of being a health professional. 
They think the barriers are too high. It's too hard to get in. It's too expensive. Da 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 da. da. And we need to disabuse people of that. And we need to start early in that. And I think all of us can play a role at the elementary school level, outreach programs to convince uh, people that these are careers that are attainable by everybody. And we will only achieve our whole goals of a equitable healthcare system uh, that reaches everybody if we have a workforce that is more representative. So I strongly believe in that. I worry about the consequences of the recent Supreme Court decision and making that more difficult. But I think that we can't stop trying and we need to re use that as a stimulus <laughs> to make our efforts even stronger um, to work to diversify uh, the, uh, uh, those who want to go in and choose to go in to the health professions broadly. Thank you, everybody, for being here today. To close us out, I'll bring up Dr. Skep. Thank you. Well, I want to uh, first announce that if any of you want to join us for the next hour, we're going to meet in room 306 in this building to just talk about whatever you want to wonder about. Because I think what Dr. Tebow has done for us today is not only shares knowledge and experience, but he's sharing wisdom. And what do we do with wisdom? Well. I think it says when he says he's worried, we should be worried. When he says we're not so sure, we should be not so sure. And so you can tell us where you've been and what you've done, but you're aware, alerting us that there are some things down the pike that are not going to be easy and we have to be open to it. I learned something from a patient at an oncology conference that Pam Kuntz and George Fisher ran. And I was, telling the audience what I thought about patients and physicians. And one of the patient's friends raised her hand. She said, Dr. Skeff, I think I know what you're trying to say. You're trying to say that I want to know that you care before I care what you know. And I think that's something that you've given us today. What's so clear in what you say is how deeply you care and that we have to have that same degree of caring as we move forward. So I thank you from the depths of my heart for making the trip to come here and help us celebrate and for sharing your wisdom. And we're going to stay worried along with you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. 306 for anybody who wants to join us. Thank you. The preceding program is copyrighted by the Board of Trustees of the Leland Stanford Junior University. Please visit us at med.stanford.edu.